You know, I think Sid is easily the worst person at trying not to stand out. <laughs> like, like, I don't know why he does some of the stuff that he does, because it feels like it has the opposite effect. Now, I usually understand whenever he does something in the effect to not stand out, and it just happens to work out the way that he doesn't want it to work out. Like the whole thing with him confessing to Alexia, it, it blew up in his face. And, and again, that was a move that he did that you would assume if he is a background character wouldn't work out, but it worked out. But this whole, he does so many other things where it's like, what you're doing there technically makes you stand out. Like for this, for instance, for episode seven of the Emmons and Shadows, having him go to this tournament and then purposely try to stand back up over and over and over again draws attention to yourself. I don't know. I don't know what, how is that being a background character when you stand up to her insane blows over and over again when everybody that she defeated before couldn't take but one hit? Again, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't know. Maybe in the light novel, it explains that he was doing it for a purpose, but it doesn't make sense from an anime perspective. That's for sure. But yeah, good episode. Really just a lot of shenanigans around him trying to stay a background character while th stuff's kind of building up around him. I especially like the opening sequence where they have this whole conversation between Nu and Sid. I guess I'm starting to believe that Nu is not a bad person. My last episode impressions, I kind of assume that Nu is going to be one of those characters that is working for the bad guys and somehow infiltrated into the Shadow Garden. But it seems like based on the statements that she was making away from Sid, leads me to imply that she is working for the good of Sid. Now, if she ends up still being somebody that's been implanted, then I'll point back to this scene and go, but this scene doesn't make any sense if she's a bad guy. <laughs> but yeah, it was great. Her scene basically laying out this fact that there's these named individuals amongst the uh, Diablos group, and there's one in the royal capital. Additionally, talking about the guy that she interrogated, which, yes, he was brainwashed. Apparently, it's some sort of trait of the cult of Diablos. They bring in orphans and they brainwash them through drugs and stuff and make them work for them. And so she wasn't really able to get anything out of this guy because he was so far gone. Which again, normally I would say, yeah, she disposed of him to cover it up. But again, it seems like based on what she's saying that Sid guides them to the true path and that he has this knowledge of the shadows makes me believe that she technically is not a bad person. But it was funny that the entire time she's laying all this stuff out, Sid's busy looking at this pamphlet. He's been signed up for this tournament by his friends and he's just trying to figure out how he's gonna deal with the situation. And so he's responding to what she's saying, but he's responding about something else <laughs> the entire time. So she's like, just like expected from our leader. And no, he's not talking to you, girl. But additionally, we got a brief shot of something in News Pass. It seems like she was supposed to go to an academy like this, but something happened. I, it seems to imply that she had the same thing happen to her that happened to Alpha, maybe like a, a, a mana overload and she turned into a blob. But she was dancing with somebody and that person she was dancing with seems to be the boy that's currently guarding Sherry. Because right when she's thinking about this, he so happens to be walking over to sit down at the table. So I'm guessing there's going to be some sort of history between the two of them. But no, I like that when he goes to leave, he's thinking, to, he's talking to himself about, oh, I have like, I thought 24, 25 of these things. I'm going to need to get twice as much of those. It didn't dawn on me until I finished the episode when I thought back to that whole <laughs> statement. He was talking about the little gems that he was chomping down on to spit out fake blood. <laughs> Or it might have been blood, actually. But yeah, this cuts to the tournament where we have Claire just defeated somebody. Everybody's talking about how, yes, Idis has her eyes on Claire. She's doing a great job. But they're not sure how she's going to handle Rose. Which we get the introduction of Rose, which is the ringlet girl that was stopping Claire in a couple episodes ago. But she is the best swordsman of the Academy. The princess of the Oriana Kingdom, which is the land of art and culture. Which, yes, this turns into this whole thing between her and Sid where she's defeating him. And he's spitting up all this fake blood. <laughs> But again, like I did, like I get, I got a huge kick out of the fact that the moment that he hits the ground and his back like cripples in on itself and he somehow like shifts around in a circle and then gets back up on his feet <laughs> and then she hits him. Great reuse of animation there, by the way, uh, just reusing the same animation. But it, it was all to the comedic beat of he just keep, he just keeps getting up like again. I don't understand how this is not standing out. He's basically taking blow after blow after blow from this really skilled person Yes, you could argue that they're really only going to see that you're super durable and you're not skilled to fight, but that's still standing out. That's standing out really badly. And yes, you're technically gaining the admiration of your opponent who, yes, from Rose's perspective, this guy has a lot of pride and he's able to stand up over and over again. He's got great character. Like, I defeated him in the battle, but he won in spirit. 
So yes, he's gonna gain the admiration of this girl. I don't know how that plays into later on because you mentioned the idea that when he finally went back to school, everybody was like treating him really nicely. I don't know if they're just pitying him because he got the crap beat out of him <laughs> or because again, he stood up against her. But now the final segment was really around Sherry. <laughs> In the opening scene, we had Sherry very detailedly eating candy and being absorbed in it, recounting the memories of her father saying, you know, this boy is probably for, uh, for love at first sight. He gave this to you. He's probably expecting a response. And so, yes, sure enough, this candy won over her heart and she is dead set on being with Sid now because all you have to do is give a girl candy and they give you your dying devotion. But no, it was cute, though. It leads to her confronting Sid, giving him cookies and saying that she wants to be his friend. And it leads to him like, you know, it's fine. I mean, if we're going to be friends, that's that's perfectly fine. Sure, that, that, that sounds good. And she's super happy about it. And she immediately turns around and says, Father, I did it. <laughs> and the father is on the other side of the glass. I half expected him to look over and go, wait, you weren't supposed to point out that I was here. Uh, super cute. I, It really does play in this whole idea that she's very sheltered and she doesn't have much experience with people. And so, yes, when she finally succeeds at something, she just wants what father knows. She doesn't know that that's kind of corny to let somebody know that your father is nearby. But no, when the father comes out, that's when he realizes, oh, crap, this is a named character. Sherry's a named character. These are, This is... These are people on my list of people that I'm supposed to be avoiding. I'm not supposed to have in contact with named characters because then that just brings attention to myself. But it was still cute. Just I've kind of mentioned the idea of, oh, you know, look, she's had she looks cheerful now, but she's had a rough life in the past. So please take care of her. She's obviously being very embarrassed about it, even though she called to her father the moment she got friendship confirmation. But no, this got worse because at some point after this scene, we have this scene where Sherry is alone again and she's eating chocolate very, very detailed like again because the, the chocolate, I guess, makes her very happy. It's a very good chocolate. But she's obviously upset because Sid isn't going to school because he said that he's trying to avoid Sherry by staying away from his school. And so she wants to go see Alexia because she knew that he was with Alexia at some point. And I'm like, oh, crap, are they going on Derry? <laughs> like, are they going to go on Derry with this character? I guess they still could, but it seems like they kind of avoided that at some point because she does go meet Alexia. And I thought this was a fantastic scene. <laughs> Pretty much Sari coming in there. Alexia's like, oh, so you're here for the research. No, I'm not here for the research. Oh, so you're, you're, you're here for this thing. Oh, no, I'm not here for that. So what are you here for? Oh, well, I remember seeing you with Sid. Are you with Sid? She's like, no, no, that was all fake. We weren't actually together. Uh, we were just, it's, I don't want to get into it, but there's a reason why we were faking to be, you know, in a partnership. She's like, oh, that's great. I know I just became friends with him and I was really concerned that you guys were together. And the other time Alexia's like <laughs> breaking her cup because she's realizing that Sid's going off with some other girl after denying her. Um, so I'm, I, I think at this point, I'm really interested to see how that kind of turns out. This whole thing where Alexia just got turned down. And then here's this bookworm researcher and she's with Sid. Uh, it was hilarious because the moment that Sherry leaves, her guard's about to follow her. And suddenly you can hear all this crashing inside the room as Sherry's super happy. But then Alexia's like super mad. <laughs> but yeah, then we get the scene where they come back to school. Sid's like, everybody's being nice to me. And they're talking about elections that are coming up. Ringlet's Rose comes in and then suddenly this Knight from the previous episode shows up and they create this bubble around the school. It, the bubble seems to be affecting magic itself as Sid notices very quickly that this barrier was created. Nobody else seems to notice it, but he does note that his little slime manipulation isn't really working. So this bubble is suppressing spells. So yeah, when the fake shadow garden comes in, <laughs> Ringlet's immediately is like, you guys are kind of dumb to be attacking a school of dark knights. But then yes, she's not able to use her spells. So that leads her to having a disadvantage. And then Sid jumps in like he usually does to protect her and gets hit. <laughs> so I'll be really curious to find out how he's going to explain this in the next episode, because I don't know. I never, I can't quite get Sid as somebody that wants to protect people. I haven't quite figured out him as a defender. I see him as a glory seeker in the shadows, but I haven't really got a sense from him yet that he wants to protect other people. So I don't know that him jumping in front of Rose is because he's trying to protect her. I see him jumping in front of Rose because he wants to be a background character. But ha again, how is that being a background character putting yourself as a self-sacrifice? The only thing I can assume is that he's taking the hit so that he can fake that he's dying and then he can sneak out and do something else. Or again, maybe he does actually want to protect people. Again, I, I haven't quite gotten that yet. And yes, technically, like the first episode, he went out of his way in order to save, what was her name, Nishino or something like that. So it does seem like he wants to help people, but 
I've never gotten inner dialogue of him where he's like, I want to help people. I want to protect people. It's always, I want to be the Eminence in Shadows. I want to do this stuff in the dark. So I'll be curious to see, again, how he's going to explain why he's, you know, sacrificing himself to save Rose. It does seem like he was manipulating somehow with magic. It just seems like this thing was suppressing it. So he might still be able to protect himself as he's saving Rose, or he could have actually taken an actual blow. We'll have to see. Uh, I'll be I'll be interested to see how how well he hides w who he is in the face of this whole attack. I'm I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure the actual Shadow Garden's already there, but we'll see. Anyhow, that's my thoughts on episode seven of the Animus and Shadow. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. As always, if you did, make sure to hit that like button down below, comment, let me know what's the episode. If you're new to the channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you get all my content. I do news reviews, first impressions, top list. If it's anime, it's pretty much here. Additionally, if you want to support the channel more, we have a Patreon link, a tips link, and a super thanks button down below. Greatly appreciate it, but it does, and y'all take care.